Hello and welcome to the Global Church Project. I'm Graham Hill. Sammy Awad is the Executive Director of the Holy Land Trust. His father became a refugee at the age of nine after his father was killed in the 1948 war and the family was forced out of their home into what is now West Jerusalem. His father is the founder of the Bethlehem Bible College in Bethlehem. His mother is from the Gaza Strip. At a young age, Sammy was influenced by the teaching of his uncle, who is a Palestinian activist who promoted non-violent resistance to the occupation during the First Intifada and was arrested and deported for his peaceful and non-violent actions by the Israeli government. Through working with Marabuk, Sammy was influenced to try to develop leaders and visionaries in a global non-violent movement. He was influenced by people like Jesus, Gandhi and Martin Luther King. Since his return to Palestine, he founded the Holy Land Trust. He's promoting non-violence, healing and transformation work, and developing people all over the world who speak in all, from all different countries about peace, about community, about non-violent resistance, about what it means to be followers of Jesus Christ in a conflicted and war-torn world. You're the Executive Director of the Holy Land Trust. Can you tell me something about the aims and the programs? Yeah, the uh, Holy Land Trust is a local Palestinian organization mm -hmm. located in Bethlehem. And, and what we believe is that peace is actually possible in the Holy Land between Palestinians and Israelis. And uh, this is our vision, this is our work that we do, this is our commitment to really bring uh, real peace and reconciliation between the communities of this land. The way our programs function is that we made a decision, and I think it was a spiritually led decision mm -hmm. a few years ago, uh, not to fall into the trap of thinking that peace is just about achieving a political solution. So most of the time when you ask people, uh, what does peace mean to you? They're thinking of what is the best political solution uh, for their nation or for their community. For us, the work we do tries to look within each community and ask what are the challenges that each community carries that don't allow them to make peace with the other, that are preventing them from building relationships of trust and respect with the other, and then to address these challenges within each community. So we don't have a political vision for the Holy Land. Yes, we understand that at some point there will be a political framework because this is what we live in, nation-state structures, but our work is really about the communities. And what we feel is that unless the communities fully acknowledge and recognize the right of the other communities to live in this land in dignity, in peace, in equality, uh, in respect, then we think that no political agreement will last. And so this is the commitment uh, that we do. And we work with all segments of this community, Palestinians, Israelis, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. We look at this land, and this is where our name comes from, as the Holy Land. It is one land that is uh, a land that has three beautiful religions that exist in it, have always existed in it since their beginning, and will always be here. Uh, and uh, so our work is looking at all of the communities of this land and addressing all the needs of these communities. And what are the key principles of nonviolence that, that shape the way in which you engage these issues? So one of the key commitments that we carry as an organization is a commitment to nonviolence. Uh, we fully believe that violence in any way, shape or form uh, is not right and it's not justified and cannot be excused by any group of people towards another group of people. Mm. And our commitment is to empower people to engage in demanding for their rights, but doing it through nonviolence. And, and this is what the term nonviolence means for me. It's just empowerment. Those who are enslaved, those who are oppressed, those who are marginalized, to be able to say, I can take responsibility, I can take action to achieving liberation uh, from whatever uh, violence that I am experiencing. I don't have to wait for somebody to come and do it. I cannot just continue to blame the other for what they're doing to me. I can be empowered and take action and achieve the results that I want in my life. What are some of the key biblical or theological ideas that, that, that shape what you do? Well, I would say, uh, I mean, for me, when I look at Jesus and his teachings and everything that he did, his ministry was one that I have learned and continue to learn from. And I would say the biggest, biggest transforming point in my life was uh, when a few years ago I decided to uh, read uh, the scripture again and, and read the Gospels and reading the Sermon on the Mount, I was very mm -hmm. struck by his calling to his followers to love their enemies. Mm -hmm. And then for me, it, it 
it, you know, as Christians, it's a statement that we're kind of proud of because it's kind of unique to our faith. Uh, but to really begin to ask, who is living this? How many people are actually following this commandment? And instead of using that as an excuse not to, for me to decide what do I need to do to be a follower of that commandment? I mean, the first thing I realize it's an order. He doesn't give me a choice in it. He's not telling me, I'd like for you one day to consider loving your enemy or I hope you reach a point. No, like, you want to follow me now, you love your enemy. You have enemies, you need to love them. And so it's a commandment and, and you cannot pick and choose, uh, you know, which commandments to follow and which not to follow. Uh, the, the second uh, uh, opening for me was to begin to realize that uh, he wasn't just talking about making peace with the enemy. He wasn't just talking about reconciling. He wasn't just talking about signing a treaty uh, with your enemy uh, to resolve a conflict. And so for me, that bigger vision has been my key motivation now is, is what does it mean to love the enemy? And it, how do we begin to understand the enemy, to be, even to understand the needs of my enemy? You know, as a Palestinian, I am oppressed by the Israeli government and military. And how can I be in a place where I can even begin to understand, not justify, understand mm -hmm. what causes people to behave this way mm -hmm. to me? And, and that has even increased my commitment to nonviolence because another key component of, of the work that Jesus did uh, was that he did uh, a lot of healing work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and sometimes we look at the healing that Jesus did uh, as, uh, as if he's trying to show off how great yeah. he is. Uh, but more and more I began to realize that his healing work was intended to liberate people. This is where freedom comes from. Those who are uh, physically, emotionally, or spiritually ill, uh, he comes to, to heal them, to free them from the constraints that are not allowing them to live out their humanity the way God intended this humanity to be lived out. And so even when I look at my enemy, and I say, my enemy also needs healing. There's a lot of pain and trauma. Uh, and if I look into the Jewish community specifically, yes, there is a history of pain and trauma, and the high point being the Holocaust and what happened there. And all of that trauma has been carried into this conflict, uh, all of the fear of the other, all, the, all of the mistrust of the other. And so our work, for me more and more, it's, it's really embedded more into his teachings and, and what he calls his followers to do. Where do you see signs of hope? in this land? It's very difficult. It's mm. really difficult. Um, uh, you know, signs of hope in, in this land are very limited. Uh, but I would say, and it might sound very strange, I actually see growing hope in the growing hopelessness that exists. Mm. And I say this because I see more people giving up hope on everything that they've been promised was yeah. the answer, and everything they've been promised was the way to achieve this answer. And so, yes, this might take people into phases of resignation. This might take people into phases of indifference, of not wanting to engage, of trying to take care of their own. But at some point, there will be a movement from these people who have given up on the hopes of the past to begin to ask, where is the new hope for the future? And if I want to speak about a specific group, I would say the young generation, uh, the youth, and I would say specifically the Palestinian youth, are in a place where they're questioning everything they've been told, uh, are ready to question even the leadership structures that we have and the promises our leaders made, and to begin to really ask what is the future that they want to create for themselves and the generations to come. And so there are many opportunities there. I also see uh, growing hope in a group of people that many people have said is the obstacle to peace, which is religious uh, leaders. Yeah. And, and for me, one of the things I began to realize more and more is that the marginalization of the religious voice from the peace process was a detriment to the peace process mm. itself. Saying that religion is the problem, mm. take it out of the equation, and we take the problem out and we'll be able to resolve mm. this conflict which is deeply religious. Not religious mm. in terms of, of religious conflict, but people are very religious in it, mm. especially when it comes to the mm. connection to mm. the land. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to say that we could resolve this as a secular Western conflict through negotiations in a Western way, all of this has not worked. And so for me, I'm actually seeing more hope come from people who were historically marginalized from the process, Christians, Muslims, and Jews, who are using their faith as a means to ask what does peace and justice in this land truly look like.
How did your uncle's life and witness inspire you in this work? My uncle uh, started this work in the early 80s. I was 12 years old mm -hmm. when, they, when he first engaged in nonviolent activism here. And, and the two things that happened with my uncle was the first one, this sense of personal empowerment, the sense that I can do something. Uh, I grew up living under occupation. I grew up living under the oppression of the Israeli military and never knowing what I could do, especially in a family that always said violence is not the answer. Well, what is the answer to make mm -hmm. peace? And so he came up with this idea of nonviolent mm -hmm. uh, activism, studying Gandhi and studying Martin Luther King and, and many other examples. And so for me, that was very inspiring. Uh, the second major thing that happened was when my uncle was arrested by the Israeli government, mm -hmm. he was put on trial and he was deported. He was physically kicked out from this land, never allowed to live here again, specifically because mm -hmm. of his work in nonviolence. Mm -hmm. And I saw thousands of people protest, Palestinians and Israelis coming together to protest mm -hmm. the arrest and deportation of my uncle. And that was very inspiring for me and very challenging to begin mm -hmm. to ask what is the power of nonviolence that makes a government as strong as Israel see in this one person a threat and decided to deport him. And so that, that was the time I fully committed to engaging in this question and trying to answer it. How do you see that the global church, um, people in Australia, for instance, or in the US, can begin to, begin to understand some of the issues that we've been talking about in this land, but also begin to partner with the Palestinian church? Yeah. I think it's very, very important for the church to come and to engage. I think one of the big things we always call upon is that the church has forgotten that this is the birthplace of our faith, and this is not a tourist site. I, I sometimes say sadly that uh, you know many Christians who come here as uh, tourists or claiming to be pilgrims come here treating the Holy Land like Disneyland. Yeah. Uh, they complain about the lines, they complain about the food, yeah. uh, they just want to get the next picture taken with the, the, with the next site. Yeah. And there isn't the real engagement with the communities of this land. Mm -hmm. Specifically, I would say the local Christian population, mm -hmm. which many people who come here don't even know we exist, yeah. but also with the entire population, the local Muslims, the local Jews of this land. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's very important to do what Jesus did was he went and met the people. He walked in the communities. He met the Samaritans. He healed the Romans. He engaged with the communities. He engaged with all the peoples of this land, learned, listened mm -hmm. to their stories, had compassion towards them. And, and that, for me, creates a big space for a possibility of healing in mm -hmm. this land. And so, for me, I don't want to see the church engaging in, again, the political discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus never had a political solution. To the, to the Roman occupation. He didn't do shallow diplomacy between Rome and Jerusalem trying mm -hmm. to resolve this conflict. And I think many churches think that this is what peace is about. Uh, for me, peace is about, again, doing what Jesus did, which is creating a space mm -hmm. for healing, for freedom, for reconciliation, for bringing people together at the table, for us to be humble in listening to the needs of these communities and to see what we could provide them so that they can be strengthened to make the right decisions for their lives. And let the Palestinians and Israelis come up with the right decisions. Mm -hmm. Let us not be part of the dynamics of being pro this and anti this mm -hmm. and criticizing this and arguing against this. There are people that live here. All of them have been created by God in God's image. And we are responsible for healing and providing for all the peoples of this land. Mm -hmm. And let the politicians then figure out the rest. <laughs> yeah. What's your dream for this land and for its people? Well, my dream is to truly see every single individual for whatever faith they carry and whatever they believe in to be fully honored and treated as an equal in this land. Mm -hmm. To be recognized, uh, for me as a Christian, to be recognized that yes, this whole land actually has meaning to me and meaning to my faith, that it's not limited just to Bethlehem because Bethlehem is in the West Bank or in the Palestinian areas. That for me as a Christian, Jerusalem is key, Nazareth is key, the Galilee is key. And I should have full freedom and access to all of these sites of worship, to have equal access to the resources of this land, uh, movement in this land, uh, movement in and out of this land, to be treated as equal as my Israeli Jewish neighbor. And for me to fully recognize the full right of the Israeli Jew also in the entire land, uh, to begin to realize that most of the religious sites for the Jewish community actually exist in the West Bank, in the land that they wanted to give me as a political 
a token to establish a state, mm -hmm. which was going to create more conflict just because we marginalized that religious voice. Yeah. So how can I say for the Jews, yes, this is your land. For the Christians, this is your land. For the Muslims, this is your mm -hmm. land. And instead of this being the point of contention, that is the point mm -hmm. of really starting to make peace. Mm -hmm. So my dream uh, is is a land where everybody is honored and respected, uh, where nobody is fighting the other for possession or power, we're sharing the resources and engaging in what I would fully believe making the Holy Land become a real model to all nations, uh, to be a light to all nations, for all of us to come together and be that light where they can see and they say, if these people can do it, so can we. I mean, it feels in some ways like the world is becoming more divided um, and polarized. How do we in this, this kind of environment become neighbors and partners, see each other's humanity? What are your thoughts about that journey? For me, it starts with a commitment to listen to each other, to really hear each other's stories. Uh, and it's not about arguing facts. Uh, each person has their story. You know, we don't have two stories here, Palestinian story and Israeli story. I think we have 13 million stories yeah. uh, in this land. Yeah. And to really be able to listen and to really begin to create a space where how can we honor the past? How can we respect the past, heal the past, learn from the past so we don't repeat the mistakes from the past, but at the same time to begin to engage together and all of us asking the question, what is that future we want to create? And how can I make my decisions in the present to achieve that future instead of my decisions based on the past that I experience, which will never make that future possible at all because the future is full of pain and yeah. suffering. So if we don't deny the pain of the past. We need to acknowledge it. We need to admit it. And we need to come out and, and really uh, create a space for healing of that past. But to have a vision of the future and I think this is the way that that we can get together mm. and for me this is kingdom teaching uh, you know when Christ calls us to bring the kingdom at hand bring that mm. future vision into our present and to begin living it even if the reality uh, is difficult to to create that and as you said there is polarization and there is marginalization and there is tremendous ha hatred and fear mm. in the communities for us to stand in that space and to ask as peacemakers, what is that future we want to create together mm. and how can we make our decisions to make that mm. a possibility? What's most misunderstood about the things that you say? <sighs> well, many things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I think the, the biggest challenge for people mm. here is still the notion that peace is still defined as a political solution. Mm. So I would say everything and then, oh, yeah, but, but what is your political agenda? Yeah. What, what is the end game for you? Yeah. And it's very difficult for people to understand that I really don't have yeah. a political solution that I endorse. There's, mm -hmm. there's 23 solutions out there, mm -hmm. and I say none of them work if we don't have the foundation. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is the biggest challenge, which creates mm -hmm. a lot of questioning about the work we're doing, because we do engage with everybody. We meet with everybody. Mm -hmm. Any Jewish Orthodox leader who wants to meet me and talk with me, I'm ready to meet with them. I don't say no to, to these meetings. And let us disagree on the table. Let us argue on the table. Let us leave each other without agreement on the table. But at least we've had that discussion take place. And I think the biggest challenge, I think, for many Palestinians is this notion that we have tried everything with them and nothing has worked. So we should boycott them and anybody who does anything with them is called a normalizer. This is sort of the term that's used now. And on the Israeli side, it's almost very similar. They think we've tried everything, we've done everything, we've given them, and they still attack us and they still fight us. So let's just marginalize them and, and let's see how fate uh, deals with it. And so this is something that we're trying to challenge. We need to bring people together and not to dialogue for the sake of a shallow engagement of saying all that, you know, eat hummus together and be friends, but to really go into the deep issues mm. of fear, hatred, and resentment that exists, not mm. politics, not scenarios of solutions, which typical dialogue is based on. How do I heal my fear of you? How do I heal the inherited fear that I carry that prevents me from seeing you as mm. a human being as well? And that's, that's the journey we're taking. And it's, I think it's very new to people here. Uh, and, and we're hoping the more we talk about it, the more people will, will accept it and, yeah. and start listening to us. Yeah. Samuel Wad, thank you for joining us at the Global Church Project. Thank you.
The Global Church Project is located at www.theglobalchurchproject.com. On our website you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges, universities and churches. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.